Hey, Justin Baldoni here. Just wanted to let you know that my next book, Boys Will Be Human, a get real gut check to becoming the strongest, kindest, bravest person you can be, is available for pre-order right now. You can go to boyswillbehuman.com. That's boyswillbehuman.com. It comes out October 4th. And I am so proud of this book. It's a book that I desperately needed when I was in middle school and high school. So if you know a boy that is between 11 and 100, I promise you this book is for them. That's boyswillbehuman.com. Coming up on Man Enough. For women who are listening who say, oh, I can't find a good guy. And for men who are listening who say, I can't satisfy any woman. I don't want to date anymore. What would you tell those people? You know, don't dick around and then say I'm not meeting the right person. Because what? You're waiting to be dazzled? You're waiting to just like suddenly melt? The plot is much more thick than we typically want to, to let it be. Being man enough, what does that mean? It's really manly to mess up, admit you're wrong, and then grow. I couldn't accept that I was evil, so maybe I'm broken, but those broken things could be corrected. Intimacy between a father and a son is me just wanting to like put my head in your lap. I love you, son. You haven't called me a benevolent sexist, but my experience is women are better. Even if it's a positive, it's still not equality. I don't blame men for that. I just blame the system. This is Man Enough. Hello and welcome to the Man Enough Podcast. My name is Liz Plank. My, I'm being my so name. official. I was like, wow. I'm being so no, we have to keep official. that in. Uh, hello. Hello, and welcome. my name is Liz Plank, and uh, welcome to the program. I'm Justin Baldoni. <laughs> What's happening? I'm Jamie Heath. We have a, a friend of both of ours on the show today, mm-hmm. Esther Perel, Esther Perel, the amazing Esther Perel. But before we get into that episode, what do you want to talk about, Liz? I feel like there's something you really want to talk about, Liz. I feel like I want to talk about how great your dating advice is. I think that there is a hack out there that I'm going to try. I'm going to do like this for a couple of months and see what it, uh, what, if it's good or bad. But I feel like married men give really good mm. advice to mm. single women. Mm. And I feel like it's not our go-to. Mm-hmm. As a single woman, I'll go to my single friends or I'll go to, I'll just go to women and maybe, I don't, maybe single men actually, because I'm like, oh, you're also, no, married men kind of are very good. I'm so at, happy you said that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I've never understood, Jamie and I have this joke, <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, mm-hmm. right? We have a group of friends, mm-hmm. some are married, some are not. Yes. And the ones who are not married seem to go to each other for advice. Mm. Oh my God. And we both are like, what are you doing? Are you doing? And it never ends well. And it we're sitting here, well. we're right here. We even have a podcast. And it's almost as if they don't want to come to us because they don't want the truth. That's what oh, I believe. Oh, oh, I see. And I think it'd be really healthy for yeah. single people mm-hmm. to go to married people. It's actually yeah. the men, though. The, it's women the, men. Our, the women in our lives come to us all the time and we have conversations with mm-hmm. but the men. No, it's the men won't come to us. That keep going to the echo chamber of what they're doing. And what do they doing. get in the echo chamber of single validation. men? What, what do, okay, validation. Okay, single men they tell get each validation. other. Validation. She's not the one. She's, she's not, not the one. So she's we have bad. one good friend who I love, who Justin has a phenomenal marriage. I believe I have a phenomenal marriage. We, we have do. women that are wonderful. Yeah. We, 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 we hopefully do. treat them really well. We work on it. We yeah. work on it. We do all the work yeah. and, and the fruit, you see it. And some of our friends look at us and they go, I want a marriage like that. Me and such and such don't feel like that. We're like, because you're not putting in the work. Mm. You're not doing what we did to get here. What's the work? What's the... The work is listening, listening. therapy, having conversations, um, acquiescing, learning how to radiantly acquiesce versus dull resignation, right? Which is what a lot of men do. Just fine, fine. You want to do that? Being willing to hear feedback, Mm -hmm. asking. Mm -hmm. um, Talking to other men. For advice, like if I'm going through stuff, actually going to Justin, who will be like, dude. Not making our women our therapists Mm -hmm. is a huge one. Mm -hmm. I have two friends that are um, divorcing now. One just divorced, one's in the middle of it. And both of them, when you ask them what's going on, they blame the woman. Mm -hmm. It's always, you know, well, she's not this, she didn't do this. It's like, dude, what did you do wrong? Yeah. How could you be better? Exactly. My father told me something when my first marriage, Mm -hmm. when we split up, I was 22. I got married at 18. And he was like, why are you guys splitting up? And I was like, oh God, she's this and she's that. And it's been tough for this. And you know, it's really challenging for this matter Mm -hmm. of her. He had said, how much percentage would you say uh, uh, of your divorce is on you and how much is her? And I was like, it's probably 90% her. Wow. And he said, okay, 
you spend the rest of your life working on your 10%. Yes. Or the 5%. It's probably 50%. But even if you think it's only 10%, spend every day only focused on you mm -hmm. and not her 90%. That's mm -hmm. not going to serve you because then you can become better. Yeah. For your next part of life. And oftentimes we don't do that. Yeah. You have to focus on you. How can I be better? What can I do better for my wife, Natasha? How do I show up in a way? Just don't blame her for anything. Yeah. And we don't do the work. We don't do the work. There was a study that I read. The majority of divorces that come from people who marry multiple times happen for the exact same reason. Yeah. They tend to get divorces. And the reason why is identical to the first. No it's way. because they've never done the work. Yeah. They don't do the work. It's mm -hmm. always about the other person mm -hmm. versus about, okay, what accountability can I take? Yeah. And so what I tell men is every time that we've, that my wife and I have been in an argument and she has feelings about something, mm -hmm. if I take a pause, I will recognize that she's right and I need to come back with some, with some sort of growth, with some sort of, I learned this, thank you. It yeah. doesn't mean I'm never going to repeat the problem mm -hmm. again, but the chances are she's right. Yeah. And there's a room, there's room for me to grow. Yes. And she brings that same thing in where there's times where I have feelings about things and she has to listen. And when both people do that work. It's amazing. That's what I, it's, yeah. not, it's not always fun. Uh, uh, also, there's been a lot of conversation around Andrew Tate, who is, how would we define Andrew Tate? A I didn't even know about him troll. until you brought him up. Yeah, why don't you give us a 30 second synopsis of who Andrew Tate is you for know those who don't know? Interesting is that Andrew Tate is someone you didn't know existed three weeks ago, but that's all over your feed r r right yeah. now. Who is he? So he is was on a reality show in the UK and he got booted off of the reality show because there was a videotape of him hitting a woman with a belt. Um, so he left the reality show and then just became kind of this online creator. He calls himself the king of toxic masculinity. You've seen videos of him shirtless, uh, smoking a cigar, talking about how women are property and women well, he's uh, deserve and to be down raped. On this? Yeah. Yes, 100%. And he's quadrupling um, down. He's basically like a pyramid <laughs> scheme. Like he is, you know, the patriarchy is a pyramid scheme and it's made up of men who participate and can game it as a pyramid scheme. So, and he has a system where he encourages other men mostly to make accounts and spread his content. And then they get like a percentage or something off of it. It's like the Tupperware MLM, like whatever, right? Like, you know, it's scam, Amway. It's but Amway. It's, but it's using masculinity. And I, you know, I think. So, uh, we talk so much about how the patriarchy gaslights women, and I also think it gaslights men into participating into a system that really doesn't actually advance them. I think, you know, Jackson Katz said this, like, he thinks that Andrew Tate is anti-male. Like, he's anti-woman, clearly, because he's sexist and believes that women should, are deserving of rape and are property. But also his view of masculinity and what men need to do to prove that they're men is also anti-male. Mm -hmm. So I think, like, we have to start seeing it, you know, that, that misogyny. I mean, it's the way that we always talk about on the show, that it's hurting everybody. I don't think Andrew Tate's just hurting women. When you say that, and, I, and I've done a bit of a deep dive once you brought his name up, mm -hmm. when I see a guy like that that has 10 million followers and they're majority male, and yeah. this like, it, it's like this, um, this fantasy that he's saying yeah. what so many men wish they could say. Right, So there's a couple systems at play here. One of them is one that we've already talked about, which is this fear of being canceled, this fear of being able to speak truth because of these forces that govern it. But the other one that I think that he's tapping into is I think a collective feeling amongst men that they don't feel enough. They feel disenfranchised. They feel like the world is against them. And what you and I and Jamie can say that that is is, well, that's just the patriarchy working against you. That's literally the system that has been built, created by and for us, mm. that is hurting us mm -hmm. and not so silently killing us. Mm -hmm. And it's creating this feeling that we'll never be enough, we'll never measure up. When we're around strong women, we become, we become uh, what's the word, emasculated, mm -hmm. which is not a real word. You mm -hmm. cannot emasculate yeah. somebody. Yeah. Like, I'm sorry, Andrew Tate, if you are listening, you cannot be emasculated if you have any sort of sense of you being enough, you being a man is simply enough. Nobody can take away mm -hmm. your masculinity. Nobody can take away your gender. Yeah. That's not possible. So this feeling of, oh, I need to, I need somebody to say all the things that I wish I could say. Oh, I, I want to own women. I want them to be mm -hmm. my property. I want to, 
that just comes from you feeling like you're not enough of a yeah. man. And yeah. why do you feel like you're not enough of a man? Because of the system that's telling you that you're not. Mm -hmm. When in reality, if all of us men could understand that innately who we are, as we are, is enough, we wouldn't have any desire to be like that. He would not have millions of followers. He would not be making money because we would know intrinsically that who we are is enough. We would want strong, badass women like you, Liz. Mm. That's what we would crave because it's in that friction, it's in that learning from women like you mm -hmm. that then we can grow, not just mm -hmm. as men, but as people. Mm -hmm. So I think he's tapping in to a deep sense of insecurity, which as we know, real men don't have. Bullshit. That's all I got to say. Can we get on to Esther Perel? Yes. <laughs> oh my let's goodness. go. We're going to talk about all I have a question. Thank you for her. all of that. What you just shared is really important. Um, I listened to 90% of what you had said. I was distracted um, for 10% of it. That was, do you have a chin? I was just wondering if you have a chin. Mm. That's what I kept thinking while you were talking. I was wondering if just <laughs> has a chin. Because, because my beard's so because long? Because your beard's so long, I just don't know if you have a chin. But we'll save wow. that for another time. Well, for those of you who are not watching, uh, my, beard is, my beard is getting long. Really and Jamie, long. And if, if Jamie can't give me shit about uh, my hair, he's going to give me shit about <laughs> so my beard. Uh, I guess he's watching too many Andrew Tate videos. Oh, um, wow. All right. <laughs> so we got Esther Perot coming up. Let, let, let's jump in because uh, this it's is going to be really, good. Really, and, really, and just really the powerful. disclaimer, uh, this was an episode we recorded virtually. Um, I didn't get to be here with you guys, um, mm. and uh, and she was in uh, she was in her beautiful place in mm -hmm. New York with that gorgeous I library know. behind her. A billion mm. bucks. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy this episode. We'll be right back with the wonderful Astaire Pro. All right, welcome back to the Man Enough Podcast. Hi, Liz and Jamie. Hi. Hey, Jay. How you doing? I'm good. You're where are you right now? I'm in the tiny house. I'm. I mean, you, you see, where we came to work. You know, honestly, the two of you together, it's a better show. It's better <laughs> to just. Be yeah, there. right. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm in Ohi. I'm here at home, and it's Emily's birthday today, so I wanted to stay and be home as much as I could today. Oh, but that's a good man. This mm -hmm. is this is one of my favorite days because we have on a friend to both me and you, Liz, and I'm sure she'll be a friend to Jamie soon. Esther Perel is the queen. She is an inspiration. She is a light and she is gracing us with her presence today on the Man Enough podcast. And it means more to me than you could ever know. Mm. Welcome to Man Enough. Hi, dear. Thank you, yeah. thank you, thank you all. Yeah. <laughs> and we've been in conversation with all three of you that I'm already really looking forward. Okay. So should we hop in? Yeah. Yeah? S. Tara Perel is a therapist, podcast host, game creator, and author. Her TED Talk um, has 40 million views. 40 million? I think it's the most, the TED Talk that people know the most is your TED Talk. Wow. Whenever I mention your TED Talk, people have seen it. It's it's really incredible. Um, and you're really recognized, Esther, as one of the most insightful, most original voices on modern relationships. And I have to tell you, one of the coolest things that you have done um, is create this awesome game that helps people build intimacy. Um, it mm. can it apply to any relationship. You can play with your friends, with your um, lover, potential lover, a great game on a first date, uh, your coworkers, your friends. And we're actually going to start by I can we play, play it? it? Yes. Can we play the so, game? Esther, we, we, we want to start with you and ask you. Ah. Um, we're just going to pick one from the from the deck. Make the cook taste their own food. There we go. Okay. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I owe a thank you to. Mm. I owe uh, many people. Many people. And by the way, Many times I feel like I owe it more than once. Mm. Um, but I owe a thank you um, to one of the people who really changed the course of my life, which was my teacher and mentor, Rich Simon, who used to be the editor of the Psychotherapy Networker, which was a trade magazine that only people in my field knew. And I showed up at this conference and he says, what are you thinking about these days? And I just blurted out, I'm thinking about Americans and sex. 
<laughs> it was during the Clinton scandal. And I he said, well, why don't you write something about it? Mm. And I said, because I love to have dinner conversations about this subject, but I don't know if I can really write a piece yeah. that would be academically, you know, rigorous enough. And he said, why don't you try? And I began and he forced me to write 11 versions of my first article that was called In Search of Erotic Intelligence. Wow. For it took a mm. whole year. He kept coming back. He kept coming back. He didn't give up on me. And mm. it was the beginning for mating in captivity. And I have owed him so much that he, you know, you owe, you yes. want to thank someone yeah. who believes <laughs> in you. Oh, thank you. You still have the old cover. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Yeah, meeting in captivity. What do you thank someone for, right? Mm. I thank him for believing in me. I thank him for the time that he invested in me. I thank him for him knowing before me what needed to come out of me. That kind of, you mm. know. Wow. Well, That's beautiful. Mm. Another of a lot of people who are thankful to you. Um, <laughs> should we ask Justin a question next? No, let's ask me a question. Okay. Are you a question? For yeah. Justin, Justin didn't come to set, so <laughs> he right. has to wait. All right. I feel like... Pick one. Okay. We're mixing it. We're doing it. This is such a fun game, by the way. It's so good. The question to me is, I lose all willpower when it comes to dot, dot, dot. Oh, I love that one. So I have a quick rule <laughs> question. Um, can I change it to I lost all willpower when it came to? Mm. Well, of course. Of course. The rules of a game are made by the people who play. Wonderful. That's what makes it alive and dynamic. Then I'm going to change it to lost um, because hopefully in my life I've corrected this. Mm. I lost all willpower when it came to being faithful to anyone in my life romantically. And when mm -hmm. I was in situations that tempted my lower nature or my uh, uh, loyalty, I would lose willpower and uh, make a choice mm -hmm. that would hurt others and myself. So I have to use the word lost because I've now been married for almost 10 years and um, and so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting that you look at it as willpower though, but I, I mm. it's a beautiful way to answer the question. Why is something that seems so impossible at some point and then it becomes actually mm. quite doable? Yeah. And what changed? You, you, you do <laughs> that's the work. Do, that's the, the right. magical question, right? And I think when we do the work, when we find out what was it that caused us to not have the will or um, control, mm -hmm. uh, what was underneath that act. And for me, there was a lot of stuff to unpack. So in doing so, right. um, I found strength in ways that I hadn't had before. Um, yeah. So maybe that's yeah, yeah, maybe that yeah. applies to many things. Love mm. that. So, Great. Uh, Liz, let's do you. Oh, go. Really going. Going in. A grudge I've been holding on to. And I feel like I don't hold grudges anymore. I probably do more than I think I do, but I find grudges so, like, they just take so much energy. It takes so much energy mm. to be mad mm. at someone. It does. <laughs> it just does. And mm. sometimes I, I go to the extreme where I just, I probably avoid to not hold the grudge because holding the grudge would mean that I probably have to deal with it. So I prefer to just Do forget. you have a grudge that you remember? One that kind of lived with you, that accompanied you for a while? I mean, maybe I have a grudge uh, against my, my ex. I, I definitely still have a grudge. Mm. I guess I do. Because, I was going to say, yeah. You know, you're like, Because whenever, whenever it comes you're, up. You're petty. Like, stop. Like, and you know what's funny is that uh. I think being petty for some reason regarding one of my exes has been a way for me, like a natural antidepressant. Like, it's just been the way for me to kind of laugh at the situation um, in order for it to not feel like it holds power over me. But I also, there's a part of me that knows that every time I kind of like mock it and again, hold that grudge and continue to let this person occupy a space in my mind, I'm kind of giving them more power that, than I need to. So I probably have to let go of um, grudges against, against one particular ex who will not be named. I will not name. Mm. When I think of a grudge, yeah, you know, it's very interesting because I just saw the person recently <gasps> and I, I, I mean, every time I see this person within a minute, I turn 14. You do? <laughs> and I remember how I felt rejected and excluded by this person who, you know, I had such power over me yeah. and it's like, it's phenomenal how one can just like in a split second go back. All the feelings yeah. from my 
body tenses mm-hmm. up the whole thing and it's just like what can I do to give it back to her <laughs> yes you imagining you I can't imagine you like that Esther I can't in that moment what do you do yeah I am amazed I smile at myself primarily I'm like as I or I yeah. say to somebody it's unbelievable how some things just never really unhook yeah mm-hmm. it sticks to me at first it's the feeling that comes back then comes the plot you know, it's the, yeah. the the grudge. That's why it is a grudge. The grudge comes first. Yeah. The story yes. or the plot comes next, you know. Mm. Yeah. I don't tell her anything, you know, it's old. It's like, plus you don't want to be ridiculous. You're still dealing with this kind right. of thing. Yes. Right. But <laughs> it's phenomenal what, me- pardon, the way memory operates. Amazing. Yeah. It needs the stimulus to have the reaction. Yeah. <laughs> I think it helps for people to know that this happens to you, right? <laughs> yeah. And how it lives in both the body and the mind. I do want to show you what the game looks like, so so we know wh- where this all comes from. It's a card game. It's a storytelling game, and it has loads of these beautiful mm-hmm. cards. And everyone invites a story because mm-hmm. we connect through stories. We have it here. Ah, you have the box. Too. I love it. <laughs> What's the question for Justin? Okay, your question is the person who taught me the most about love person who taught me the most about love that's a beautiful it's such a good one my dad my dad he told me i think it was year one or two of my marriage Emily. we just celebrated nine years this week is there Mm, and um my dad told me once that there were times in the in his marriage to my mom they've been married for 39 years now that he had to wake up and choose to love her. Mm. He had to wake up and make a conscious choice to love her, that it wasn't just an automatic thing and that there were really hard times and there were times when it got tricky for them. And I asked him because I, I was, I've been doing a lot of deep healing and trauma work. And, um, and recently I, I said, dad, I feel like there were, I feel, I feel like there were times that you never talked to me about, but I felt like there were things that were going on with you. And then he expanded on that. And, uh, and he said it wasn't automatic. He made the choice to love mom. And as he made that choice, he was able to then free fall in love with her when at times it would have been easy to separate. And, um, and I'm really grateful for that. Because love is a verb. Love is a choice. Love is an action. Love is not something that we fall into. Love is not an accident the way that Hollywood movies and we make it out to be, especially in Western culture. It is a, it is, takes work and, uh, and it takes choices. Mm. And I'm really grateful that I have a, had a dad who told me that early on in my marriage. It also gives you a lot of agency that it's not just like it left me and when is it coming back, but that you actually can generate it. It's a very generative perspective that there's certain Mm -hmm. things that you need to do and not do to put yourself in a situation that allows it to emerge. If you spend your time looking at the person and thinking about everything that irritates you about them, no, you're not going to love them. If you actually (laughs) look at them and you say, what did they do to me that makes my life more pleasant or more robust or more joyful, um, you will be more loving. And that these um, direct mechanisms between what you put in and what you get out. Mm. Mm. I love that. All right. uh, We ask everybody this question. And uh, (laughs) maybe for the, maybe for version two of, of the game, you can add this question. Um, when was the last time that you didn't feel like you were enough? I had a, a, a very interesting situation a few months back <clears throat> when I did a session for, uh, I recorded a session for where should we begin? And, uh, and I don't know if it was because I had a, 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 an intense day. God knows what brought this up. But at one point with this couple, I totally snapped. 
I just started oh. to scold them. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like bad therapy, just bad therapy. The first, so the first day is like I'm replaying it and I'm thinking, oh my God. And, you know, of course I have the choice not to put it up. But I thought, no, I think actually it would be very interesting to put up an episode where I don't do good work and where I don't know that wow. the people were well served. And, you know, the, the, if you re that's the reality. So the f then I wrote to them and I just said, you know, I'm checking in and I took total responsibility. And basically I'm told, no, 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 finally somebody who told us things as they were. Everybody else let us go on and just, you know, hurt wow. each other. And you kind of put a stop to it. So between what you think you do, and how other people experience it is a different story. Now, mind you, even though good came out of it, I still think it was bad therapy. And so then you go into the imposter story, right? Like what would so-and-so have done? How would they have handled this moment? What choice point would it have been? And what was really interesting, and that's the, the reverse. This is when I actually feel like I am enough, is I thought, oh my God, this stuff three, 10 years ago, 20 years ago would have taken me three weeks, you know, playing it over and over. And, mm -hmm. and now it was like a two day mm -hmm. thing. I went to a supervision group. I said, you know, I want you to listen to this. Is this as bad as I think it is? Because I ah. cringe when I listen to me, that tone, that tone, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, and of course, no, it wasn't maybe as bad, but it wasn't good. And man, just to be able to say, I fucked up, you know, I had a bad <laughs> session. You know, I don't have to spend my whole life evaluating myself all yeah. the time. I think that that's a really, the, 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 pro, the, the issue with your question is that we've really become con constant evaluation mm -hmm. machines. You know, mm. we check on ourselves. Am I doing enough? Well enough? Pretty enough? Smart mm -hmm. enough? Productive enough? Optimizing? Maximizing? I mean, the enough culture is yeah. crippling yes. us a little bit. Yes. I find it really very burdensome. And even like, am I healed enough, right? Something we've been talking about on the yeah, podcast yeah. Is, is even then <laughs> healing and therapy becomes this other thing you're supposed to be perfect at and, and excel at. And, you know, in a way it's yes. kind of, what I'm seeing is that it's kind of preventing people from entering intimate relationships with each other, right? There's this th thing out there we've talked about, right? Which is like, well, you have to love yourself before you're able to love someone else fully. And, you know, the reason why you're single is that there's all these things you need to heal. But you talk so much about how we heal through relationships, right? It's not alone. And I mean, a lot of work can be done alone in the dark, um, but a lot of it happens in relationships. And um, you remember when we talked about hetero pessimism? Yes. So it was coined by a queer scholar named Asa Sarazen, a term that a lot of queer people, they're looking at straight people kind of go at war with each other, right? That men are complaining about why they don't like women and women are complaining about why they don't like men. And there's all these like shows, right? Um, these reality shows like Love is Blind and uh, Love Island and, and these kind of extreme reality shows where, again, mostly straight people are just, just doing extreme things and there's big conflict and breakups. And, you know, queer people started tweeting like, you, should we, we should hug a straight person tomorrow. Like just hug a straight, like there are, are straight um. people kind of okay, right? <laughs> and and I guess, you it's know, so funny. It's, it's funny. And it's, I think it's a really interesting phenomenon. And do you feel like straight men and straight women are kind of at war at each other? And how can we heal that? How can we, you know, acknowledge the difficulties that women are feeling, uh, you know, in relationship to men and acknowledge the difficulties that men feel in relationship to women, but but build more connection through those challenges, not just like stay in our corners and, and never talk to each other. I mean, I don't like the concept of at war. Mm. I don't think that, that that that's particularly helpful. I do think that there's a lot of confusion. Mm. You know, people used to have very clear norms for dating, what you look for and how you do it and yeah. how many times and then what comes next and the sequence was laid out for you. And at this moment, you have a lot more freedom to lay out the whole process. But basically, that also means you have to define it. And to define it, you need to know what you want. Mm. And to know what you want, you need to trust that what you think you want is really what you want. <laughs> and mm. stories like, <laughs> yeah. So the, I find that it's more burdensome. It's more confusing. The norms are literally evaporating under our feet and we have to come up with new rules at a time when we have unprecedented expectations of our romantic relationships. Yeah. I think it's confusing mm. to date on an app when you have a thousand choices from which you want to find your soulmate or your one and only. 
I think it's confusing when you're one and only that used to be God for most of history suddenly becomes a person and with whom you want to experience transcendency and ecstasy and wholeness and mm. meaning, all the stuff that people used to look for in the realm of the divine mm. that they now want in their relationships. Yeah. And then the question mm. constantly is, how do I know this is the one? I mean, you know, who, what is the one? Many of us have many people. Mm. And I love what Justin said. Love is a verb. It's not a permanent state of enthusiasm. It's something you actively practice and come back to. And it's not drudge. It's actually intensely creative, but it demands real engagement. It's not, um, it's, it doesn't just fall from the heavens like a deus ex machina while you're folding the laundry. Mm. <laughs> and, but, but can I just, but what about like how it affects men and women? Like just the, the, the concept of hetero for, for women who are listening, who say, oh, I can't find a good guy and I don't even want to date anymore. And for men who are listening, who say, I can't satisfy any woman. I don't want to date anymore. What would you tell those people? Sometimes I love your question because it's very concrete. Sometimes I say, who have you been? I can't find a good guy. Mm. Have you been a good person? Mm. How have you treated this person? Right. You know, I, I once coached this woman and literally asked her to take out her feed on the phone and read to me. She said, I met this guy. He was actually really nice. We had a very nice time. And then he, he wrote to me that he would love to meet me. And I was away and I said, it felt creepy. I said, what, what was creepy? You know, he said, I like meeting you and I want to meet you again. What do you want exactly? And then, and then she didn't answer him. I said, why don't you simply answer and just say, it's really nice to get your message. I'm traveling now. I will get back to you when I, you know, don't dick around and then say, I'm not meeting the right person. You know, I, I even find, because what you're waiting to be oh, dazzled, right. you're waiting this. to just like suddenly melt. We narrow it down to one or two options of what is considered the ideal script. People have met through so many ways. People have realized slow love that grew inside of them before they even noticed it. Other people fell badly in love with somebody and then one day they woke up and they felt nothing. Yeah. I mean, the plot is much more thick than yeah. we typically want to, to let it be. And mm. I think that a lot of my work is about expanding the script. Mm. It's taking people mm. out of a limiting belief right. or a narrow story right. that they keep holding them themselves mm -hmm. to that is ultimately defeating and saying, did you ever consider this, that, and the other? Yeah. I love that. Imagine that you feel that you haven't had a good man or good woman, right? Mm -hmm. That script. That usually means that you approach the other person already with built-in resentment. Wow. Mm. Wow. So I come to you with my resentment about all the other people who were not good. Right. And I want you to surpass yeah. them. And, but An what expectation, is right? Yeah, it's a built-in yeah. expectation. What is so attractive about my resentment? So yeah. this is a piece of the... If you go in with the story of, I haven't found the right man, I haven't found the right woman, you usually go in with resentment. Yeah. How do you let go of that? Because there are people who, th that's the story, right? And that's what they're, you're right, they're bringing into every date that they're going on. How do you let go of that grief or that sadness or that hurt or that pain? It's not that you let go of it. It's that you do understand that it is not what you bring with you necessarily on the first date. Yes, you may internally know I'm more suspicious. I've been hurt. I've been wounded. I'm slower, but you don't basically put the person to the test. There's a, a beautiful episode I just did um, on Esther Calling on the Where Should We Begin podcast that where I, this guy basically, it's called Still Single at 40. And the guy basically has these stories where every time he goes for two months and then he starts to choke and then he kind of starts to make himself very unpleasant so that they finally leave him. Uh. <laughs> so he can say they leave me, you know. <laughs> um, but, the, but the whole thing is basically almost at, the, at his request, you know. I don't want to be here. You should leave because I can't go. Um, and I think the, the thing you really want that liberates us is to understand our own relational mechanisms. Mm. You know, what what is my expectation yeah. and where does it come from? And what am I trying to heal? And what am I trying to restore in my life that I'm missing? And why am I basically recruiting someone sometimes for a play that they never auditioned for? Wow. I am curious, all of this that you're sharing, how it relates. So you're on a show called Man Enough. 
right? Um, mm-hmm. And um, and one of the things that we are wanting to do is talk about this whole um, idea of masculinity, um, how I can be better as a man, how I can be better in the world, mm-hmm. so that it serves all of humanity, um, champions women, champions all people, and so much of the work you are doing, I imagine, of course, is is uh, helping that process. I'm curious how you feel, it's two questions. One is why you do what you do. Tell us like, what is it about it that you feel really is contributing to humanity? I know that it is, but I'd love to hear from your mind. And then also, do you feel that talking about things of this nature is actually beneficial to men and why? Okay, great question. So, and then the third one will be what do I think is going on with men? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we want to know. <laughs> I think one of the great compliments I've always received that I've enjoyed hearing, and because it wasn't intentional, is when people would say mating in captivity is a male-friendly book. Mm. Or when people would come to my conferences and they would say, you have a male-friendly approach. And I was like, Exactly. What does that mean? I mean, I, I, but I understood over time what made it accessible. I do think that the risk in the realm of relationships and especially romantic relationships is that it has become highly feminized. The field is 99% mm. women. You know, most couples therapists are women. And uh, there is something in the feminization of intimacy and the way we have understood these concepts that I think could could be broadened. And I participate in the broadening of those terms. You know, you can study the history of the world by looking at the history of armies, by looking at the history of rivers, and by looking at the history of relationships or the history of sexuality. Hmm. So why I do what I do is because it is the quality of our relationships that determines the quality of our lives. And that at the end, this is what people end up examining. How was I in my relationships? Family, friends, children, spouses, partners, the like. I think that the realm of relationship is utterly fascinating. It will never bore me till the end. There's always another version, another story, another plot, and it intersects with the changes in our society, in our cultures, you know. And so it's a constantly evolving story. When I think about the masculinity, and I call it the masculinity paradox, you know, historically, we discussed masculinity as a permanence. You know, nobody dreamed of questioning men. Masculinity was self-evident. It was luminous. It was natural. It was the opposite of femininity. And it appeared that men, M-A-N, was a given. And But if you look at the language, it betrays the certainty, right? We talk about masculinity as a goal as a duty, as an objective. Boys have to go in every society to prove that they are men enough. Men enough. Exactly what you're calling it, yeah? There are rituals in every society for that. Trials that indicate that there's a real task to accomplish in order to become a man. And if we're constantly encouraging and exhorting men to demonstrate their manliness, then maybe it's not as natural as we mm. would have liked ah. to think it yeah. was. Yeah. So being a man requires an effort that doesn't necessarily translate to the lives of women. We, you don't really, you don't often hear, you know, be a woman, but be a man, be a man, you know. Masculinity is hard to acquire and sometimes it's at a very high price and it's hard to develop and easy to lose. And that is proof that it was never written in stone. And so I am fascinated by the powerlessness, by the fear, by the vulnerability that men live with, that is underneath what we often look at in terms of expressions of power or precarious masculinity and all of that. And once I flipped it like that, it opened up compassion, empathy, curiosity, uh, a whole different dialogue. So I've gone to men's groups where I've been the only woman. I've gone, uh, you know, many times, many times. And I feel so honored mm. to be invited into those conversations, those spaces. Um, and I think it's something that women don't get enough of. Mm. Wow. Mm. So eloquently put. Thank you for that. <laughs> That's exactly um, what I hoped you would share yeah. and even even mm-hmm. more so. Uh, Justin, you know, you know what? We have to make space for you as well because yes. I know it's hard for you uh, not being on set. So um, in that <laughs> spirit, um, 
you well, I'm, I'm just sure you have one. A I, I'm just really lucky because I I get a chance to talk to her with no cameras sometimes, so it's very sweet, and I am more than happy to give that space. Um, it you know, was our first... first conversation. It was our first conversation no when we met. Yes, we met at friends at a dinner. I had never heard of Justin. I don't, Justin, I think, had read me, but it, it didn't matter. We were just like, and we plunged into a conversation about men and religion. Yeah, we've, well, we've had a lot of these conversations. And I, the first time we ever connected, I had told her that I had been offered this TED Talk and we were talking about it. And, and she goes, we should do one together. <laughs> And oh my God, I wish that would have been the case. Um, uh, you are such a a light in this space, and and you have a way of talking about this that is so digestible and understandable, and with so much compassion. I would want to ask you a very direct question for men. I've been thinking a lot as I've been trying to understand why we are so divided as a country. And one of the things that I practice doing is stepping outside of my bubble, outside of my comfort zone, stepping outside of the algorithm that's being pushed to me when I like something and trying to figure out what's happening with other men who maybe don't have similar views or different ideological perspectives. Because right now, what I'm observing is that men are feeling disenfranchised. Men are feeling like, and I, and I, and I'm I'm overgeneralizing, but I'm seeing a lot of anger and resentment and pain. And at first I was very confused about it. And then I I can also understand and empathize with it in some cases. But there's just a lot of almost victimization happening where men feel like they're under attack. I see a lot of men uh, not believing in therapy, um, thinking that it makes them weak. Um, I, I'm just curious, what are you observing? And what would you say to a man who maybe has this resentment, if you will? I, I believe it's misplaced, of course, and that it's actually the same thing um, hurting all of us. But I'm just curious, what, what would you say to, to a man who's just trying to do his best, who feels like there's nothing that he can do that is right? He, he, he can't please a woman. He's, maybe he's single, and he's just so frustrated with everything. It hurts. It must be really hard to feel that other men get it so easy that women say they want this and that, but then when you are those very same things, you realize that in fact, they're still drawn to other things that they're not honest, that, mm. um, men have often felt very disconnected. This is not a new feeling. Do you think this is a feeling that existed for the men in your family before you? How do you think your grandfather would have said what you're expressing today? How would your father talk about, if you know your father, what would he say? Or your brothers? Do the three children in your house say the same thing? Do you think that something different happened to you? you basically, I never talk. I ask questions. Mm. <laughs> I am more into asking questions in the way I, sp I have a conversation than in answering. I don't have any idea. You know, you feel... Um, that women have entered in spaces that used to belong to men that were very clearly defined and that let you know who you are. Because if you had the physical prowess, if you had various different things and you had given up on tenderness and on vulnerability and on connection in order to acquire power, my friend Terry Real always says under patriarchy, you know, men can either be powerful or connected, but not both at the same time. So if you feel that you gave up all those parts of you in order to become that thing called the man, and, and you didn't get rewarded for it, of course, of course you are upset. Of course you're angry. And of course you would think that it is because these women are usurping your territory and coming in there. And, you know, everybody's having those questions. The very same woman who spent her day into your territory today comes home at night and goes to a workshop of mine and says to me, how do I reconnect with the feminine after I've been out there the whole day taking charge and leading a company? Mm -hmm. You know, so everyone mm. has been has stepped out of their territories. And I say it's a really tough time for men these days because the old rules don't apply. Do you ever talk about this with any of your male friends? Right. Yeah. So <laughs> Liz and I did one of my favorite things a few years back. We went and stood in Washington Square. We put up a table and she wrote on it, free advice for men from a woman. 
Saturday morning, Washington Square, New York City, it's filled with dudes walking all around of all sorts. And every time one of them finally came, they stood in line in the end, yeah. came up to me and started talking. <laughs> one of the, 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 there was like a cluster of three or four of them around them, NYU students, people who just arrived from China to study here, people with their strollers on Saturday when mm. it's their day, etc. And every time I would ask the people around, have you ever, this, and they would say, this is my dude, this is my best friend, this is my buddy. And then I would say, have you ever talked about any of what you're telling me to your best friend? <laughs> And I said, this is a problem. Yeah. You don't talk about it mm-hmm. with your guys. So you're choking in there, swimming in your own juices. Yeah. You know. <laughs> wow. And, and then I began the conversation. What do you, do you guys feel experience this? How have mm-hmm. you dealt with this? The woman that does the girl that doesn't answer you that whatever the reason, the, the stories that they felt, you know, dissed by. Mm. And I think the most important thing, and that's what you see in your other feeds where you go is that those who succeed today are those who are able to give men a sense of community doesn't matter what the ideology is that they are circling around what they are getting is a company of other people that they can share activities with go out on saturday afternoon it's all the modern versions of the scouts Mm-hmm. in a political framework. Yeah. I love it. It's no, but that's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. It makes sense to me that you had said one of one of your greatest compliments was that um, your work is um, accessible to men and that men feel safe or that it's, um, <clears throat> it's easy, listen. And I can say, listening to you, what I loved, Justin had started mm-hmm. his question and then the first thing you had said, I think was um, you must be in pain or you're hurting. Like you acknowledged it. You started with first acknowledging where maybe the man was. And I really appreciate that about how you approach this subject. Um, Because a lot of people may not um, deserve that. I liken liken it to um, if there is a white person, as I walk through the world as a black man, and if the white person feels something um, uncomfortable or is confused by something. I can then, I have every right to just be like, yeah, fuck off. Excuse my language. Um, Mm -hmm. I have every right to do that. But if I do start with, yeah, I understand. I understand given your circumstances and how you were raised and the world you walk in, I understand where Mm -hmm. you are. Now we can do the work after that, but that is, that's helpful and diffuses it. And I appreciate how you approach that with men. And um, and let me just say this, just it'll probably go in one ear and out the other, but I have to say it because as I'm spending time with you and I wish we were in person, um, I know you from the screen and through your comments and through the, uh, the, the work that you do, but I don't know you like personally as I'm spending time with you now. And I am very jealous that Justin and Liz get to spend personal time with you. And I'm going to find a way to do it because you have moved my heart. We'll fix that. We'll you have fix that. moved my heart with your energy and your spirit and your compassion and your brilliance. And um, I'm really glad to spend this time with you. Thanks for sharing all of this. Mm, thank you. And can I uh, just jump in? I acknowledge everything you're saying and I feel it. And I, you know, we went to Washington Square Park for five hours in scorching August heat uh, and asking men questions and, and wanting to know how they feel. There's also like a part of me that's frustrated because the backdrop of this conversation is that we're now living in a country where men are literally endangering endangering the women that they sleep with, with like going to prison, right? Like in a world, in in a country where uh, the right to abortion is no longer uh, guaranteed, where women are risking like literal prison time <laughs> um, if they get pregnant and they Jeez. do not no longer want to be pregnant. I'm I'm feeling actually like a lack of those masculine virtues and a lack of those masculine dimensions that men say that they so can't express anymore. You know, a man can't be protective and provide anymore. I'm like, protect and provide, please. Right. Like show up in this conversation. And it's not to say that uh, not all men <laughs> hashtag have not showed up to this conversation, but a <laughs> lot of men haven't. Like, can you name five of your friends, male friends who have said anything about Roe being overturned? I can't. Mm. Um, and so there's a part of me that goes, yes, but I'm you sorry. You're in- yeah. But, but, <laughs> Liz, I think to be fair, um, 
I remember, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I went to a whole conversation about um, women's rights and um, the whole con the whole issue of abortion, which, by the way, in Europe, we don't call it abortion. We call it voluntary termination of pregnancy. Mm -hmm. That's a very different way of looking at it. Yeah. And it wasn't a woman's issue. Yeah. Neither was maternity leave a woman's mm -hmm. issue. Mm -hmm. It was parental leave, and that included whoever the parents are. And maternity leave in the U.S. is still a disability leave. You know, if you break a leg or if you have a kid, it's about the same. And all of these things became genderized yeah. rather than in the context of family. So once they became genderized in this way, women took ownership of some con of the conversations as well. Mm. And we didn't particularly invite the men into this conversation. That's not to say it's our responsibility. Right. But I also think the debate is not a gender debate. It's not the men against women on the abortion front in the U.S. It's a, it's a much more deeply religious and political <laughs> divide. Yeah. Ultimately, on a human level, we all want dignity, we all want agency, and we all want hope. Mm -hmm. And if we could ally on the bigger things that make us human, I think that you would have many more men and women in some of the conversations that have been segregated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love that so much. It's the same on sex. The discussion is always about how men and women are so different about right. sex rather than they actually are not that different. I mean, yes and no. It's both and. This is cross-culturally. I mean, it's like dignity it doesn't have gender. Dignity is, is about hum human. It's, mm -hmm. it's the opposite of shame. Mm -hmm. If I want to work with people, I have two boys. I have a husband. I had a father. I have a brother. I've been, mm -hmm. I and. Uh, and I think that what I'm looking for is ways in. And when I turn this thing into, you know, the sense of dignity or pride and how some people feel diminished, then I can have, you know, compassion or openness on all sides. If I go and I just see, you know, the same thing that you asked me before about the victimization, you know, who's screwing who? Right. Then I, I don't have much where to go. It's a terrible thing to want something and to depend on somebody who then doesn't give it to you. It feels like they have power over you. And interestingly, <clears throat> this is a power that women have often known from men. And this is a power that men now intensely understand from women. I mean, I, I, would, I, I just think all of this is so fascinating I, I, because I've had so much pushback privately and publicly for trying to figure out ways to message um, and invite men to the conversation around abortion rights. And it's like, I feel like no matter what I do, I do it wrong. And this is not like a pity me. I, I just, I, I just want us all to be part of this conversation. And I find that when I am trying to appeal to masculine quote unquote values or, or, or appeal to men's idealized selves, right. Of protecting, of providing, are you protecting your partner by allowing abortion bans. No, you're opening her up to like a carceral <laughs> consequence of you sleeping with her. Um, and, and, th and then I get told, ew, you're, you're appealing. I don't care how men care about this. And, and then I just, you know, it's hard how I think, and, and it's so important right now that, that, that we, that we all are part of this conversation, no matter what our gender is. So I, I guess, tell me what I'm doing wrong, you know, and, or, or how we could be doing it better. No, I won't tell you what you're doing wrong I, because I think that what you do is so, so valuable. But I will say this way. I wrote a book on a subject that was very controversial, infidelity. Mm -hmm. I could write and I knew as I was saying a <laughs> sentence how people would hear it. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, all. I got them all. You know. I got them all. And I knew how people would hear the sentence and I knew that it wasn't what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing was this, I'm not writing for everyone. Yeah. The book that wants to talk about the cheaters as scum, et cetera, et cetera, has been written and belongs to some other author. Right. I'm trying to create something more nuanced that demands no black and white, no good and bad, no victim perpetrator as the easy framework. Mm -hmm. 
And that means that there will be less people, but those are the ones that haven't found the book that they want. Hmm. And once I gave up on the, for everybody, right. then yes, of course, I, I drew upon those who were waiting for this version. You're one version. You can't talk to everybody. You can't have the same sentence go to everyone because this sentence resonates for some of the men. Right. But it totally makes the other people call you a murderer. Mm -hmm. And you need to decide. I mean, this is what I deal with as well. You know, yeah. it's like who, I'm, I'm going to talk to the broadest group possible, but I don't, there's a group I won't reach. I have an accent. I am a middle-aged woman. I am a Jew. I am a European. I, I have a lot of things that people could use to say that doesn't appeal to me. And as long as we accept that, then you become a very important voice for those who need your voice. And others will use it to trash. Yeah. And the most important thing will be to not spend too much time on the trash. Mm -hmm. mm. You better speak that truth right there. I think that was super valuable for a lot of- I think this of... is true for Jamie's stuff too. Yeah. I mean, each one of us, you yeah. know, in this, yes. uh, in this instance. It was really valuable for Does you. Does that make sense? It makes so mm -hmm. much sense, not just to what you makes so much asked, sense. which I think was really important, Liz, but I think that's applicable to so many different ways yes. of walking through things. All of us. Uh, yeah. All of us, thank you. Uh, maybe- Maybe we at some point we can do a part two because we haven't even gotten into sex yes. and all of the things that we wanted to talk about. Oh, um, my goodness. But thank you so much. Thank you all. It's a pleasure. Okay. Thank you, Thank Esther. you so much. And uh, we will we'll see you soon. I love you. And uh, congratulations on everything. Enjoy, enjoy, your, uh, enjoy your travels coming up. Bye -bye. Such a pleasure. Bye, thank Esther. you. Bye-bye. Wow. Wow. Esther. <sighs> How lucky are we? I'm really, I'm really happy you got a chance to ask, uh, ask those questions, Liz. I think, I feel like this was important. Um, it seems like it was important for you uh, personally. Yeah, I, and I, I, I'm again. I, I, it turned into like advice for me, but I really just wanted her to tell me like, how do I do this better? Um, and but, but I know that there are so many people who are dealing with similar things again in their families and their communities um, around all kinds of different issues. And I, yeah, I, I just think it's important for us to, to acknowledge again the backdrop of season two is very different from the backdrop of season one. Um, not that you know abortion was. Um, uh, a right really that was guaranteed to to a lot of women particularly poor particularly women of color already but um it is a new reality and i guess um yeah, yeah. that was like a reaction i mean it, first of all it's on my mind all the time and um but but also i think it's um yeah it just adds another sort of sort of layer to effort, to, to to dating to sex to relationships right like it, it's a big deal. Uh, so I, I think it's great to have Esther's sort of perspective on it. Yes. Thank you for asking. Um, all right, everyone. Um, we just had an amazing conversation. You know, the presence that we were in with Esther and, and what she offered. So um, with that, if you love what we're doing or like what we're doing and want to be a part of the the, the conversation, where, where can they find us and listen to us? Menenough.com slash podcast that's right and you can listen to us on all the places where you get your uh, your podcast For free. Uh, justin we love doing this without you because we get to like do the closing <laughs> you're over there in ohio enjoying the beautiful beautiful um and we're here sweating under the cameras <laughs> <laughs> all right uh we're signing off why don't yes. you take us out let's let's do and it and this is that what this was man enough or this is man enough this is man enough <laughs> i'm Liz plank <laughs> Okay. I'm listening. One more time. All right. So on behalf of all of us here at Man Enough, I'm Jamie Heath. Perfect. And who are you? And I'm J I'm Justin <laughs> Baldoni on a delay. Okay. Far and away. And that was great. <laughs> this was great. When with yours. I feel like my job, I kind of feel like my job is secure at the moment. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. I'm hanging up with you. That was great. <laughs>